Hello everyone, and welcome back to my Magic the Gathering decklist reviews. Today I'm going to cover a commander that is a fairly recent addition to my collection. That commander is Joda the Unifier. Joda the Unifier is a 5-5 human wizard for Wooburg, white, blue, black, red, and green that says, Legendary creatures you control get plus x plus x, where x is the number of legendary creatures you control. Whenever you cast a legendary spell from your hand, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a legendary non-land card with lesser mana value. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Joda is very much centered around legendary tribal, by not only pumping your creatures with the more legendaries you have, but also cascading whenever you cast a legendary spell. Though it is worth noting that Joda will only cascade when casting from your hand, so you won't be able to dig through your library much off one trigger. However, there are quite a few ways to bypass that, which I will get to later in the video. For now, let's go ahead and talk about Joda's power level. On a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being a random pile of cards and 10 being a top tier competitive deck, I would consider Joda to be a 7. While his ability to cheat out and strengthen legendary creatures are extremely valuable, the beginning turns with him are pretty slow. Having all 5 colors to cast him is fairly demanding without a significantly strong mana base, and you don't want to build much of a board state until he is out so you can start getting his cascade triggers. Because of that, if your opponents are able to go off early on or can keep Joda off the board, you'll have a much harder time trying to find the cards you need to set yourself up for a win. Though, with sufficient ramp, we should be able to get him onto the board around turn 4, even turn 3 if we get lucky enough with our card draw. And without further ado, it's time to discuss the cards in the 99. Well, not all of the cards, since that would be quite the lengthy video. Instead, I'm going to briefly touch upon some of the more powerful cards that get the deck to a win. Starting off, we have the actual win conditions, which give the deck a direction to head in terms of board state. At the most basic level, we just want to use Joda's static ability to buff all of our legendary creatures so that we can drain our opponent's life totals through combat damage. This isn't all that hard to do and mostly requires time to build up a mana base to be able to cast all of our creatures. One of the easiest ways to do this is with the two card combo of Kaya the Inexorable and Karn's Temporal Sundering. Kai's minus 7 ability gives you an emblem that says, At the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a legendary spell from your hand, from your graveyard, or from among cards you own in exile without paying its mana cost. Then, all you have to do is cast Karn's Temporal Sundering, which gives you an extra turn and exiles itself. After that, on your turn's extra upkeep, recast Karn's Temporal Sundering using Kai's emblem. From there, you will have infinite turns and ample time to cast enough creature spells to attack your opponents with. However, there are times when combat damage may not be enough. Let's say your opponents had something like a recurrable spore fog on the battlefield, which would make combat damage useless. To bypass this, we have Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. Jace's loyalty abilities can provide some card draw, which is nice, but it's his triggered ability that we are concerned with. It says, if you would draw a card while your library has no cards in it, you win the game, instead of losing it. Rather than using those extra turns from Kai and Karn to build an army, you can instead just pass each turn, drawing each card in your deck one by one until you eventually run out and Jace's trigger goes off. If you can't make your opponents lose the game, why not just win instead? And now that we have the deck's win conditions outlined, we can go over some of the cards that can help us get to them. First, we have some great card draw from creatures like Joyra, Weatherlight Captain, Shannid, Sleeper's Scourge, and Vega the Watcher. Both Joyra and Shannid trigger off of casting legendary spells, with Shannid also triggering off of legendary lands, and Vega will trigger whenever we cast anything like legendaries from Exile. Next, we have some copy shenanigans with Sakashima of a Thousand Faces and Kadric's Soul Kindler. Both offer ways around the infamous legendary rule, which is always great to have when most of the deck is filled with legendary creatures we might want to copy. Sakashima also ETBs as a copy of any creature we control, with the best target usually being Joda himself. Kadric, on the other hand, creates a token copy of other legendary permits that enter the battlefield, with the only drawback being that you have to pay one colorless to activate the ability, and they get exiled at the beginning of the next end step. However, with a sufficient supply of mana, it wouldn't be all that hard to build an instant army, seeing as how both of these cards can make all of our legendary spells much more worthwhile to cast. After that, we have some Graveyard Recursion with cards like Kethys, the Hidden Hand, and Rada Drabic of Urborg. Kethys reduces the cost of our legendary spells by one colorless, and by exiling two legendaries from our graveyard, the rest of the legendary cards there can be played as normal, which is a great way to recover from something like a board wipe. Rada Drabic makes token copies of any of our legendary creatures that die, though the copies we make are non-legendary. And when these two cards are used together, your opponents might find it hard to keep any of your creatures off the board for long. Up next are two very powerful mana rocks. Those rocks are Relic of Legends and Honor Worn Shaku. 
Relic of Legends is basically a command sphere, except you can tap other legendary creatures to untap it. In essence, all of your legendary creatures become mana dorks, except they can tap without haste, since Relic of Legends is the one making them tap. Honor Worn Shaku is very similar to Relic of Legends, with two key differences. First, it only taps for colorless mana, but it allows you to tap any legendary permanent you control. This includes stuff like Planeswalkers, Artifacts, and Enchantments that normally don't care about being tapped or untapped, so there's no real drawback for getting a bit of colorless mana. The best part about these cards is their synergy with Joda, since whenever you cast Legendary Permanents, those permanents become fuel to cast even more Legendary spells. In a deck like this one, these mana rocks are often more useful than even Soul Ring. Another great category of cards are Utility Creatures. These are creatures that have an activated or static ability that generally helps the deck get to its win conditions. It includes Emil the Blessed, Sisse Weatherlight Captain, Samet, Voice of Descent, and Urabrask the Hidden. Both Samet and Urabrask are mainly here because they give our other legendary creatures haste, which is vital to a deck based around combat damage. However, Samet has the additional ability to untap another one of your creatures, as well as a bunch of stapled on keywords. Urabrask makes your opponent's creatures enter the battlefield tapped as well, which can vastly slow them down. Emil has an activated ability that flickers your creatures, which is great to protect from removal, reuse tap abilities, and in the case of Kadric, make a bunch more legendary tokens. Sisse's activated ability allows you to search your library for any legendary permanent and put it directly onto the battlefield, with the only restriction being its mana cost has to be less than her power. However, this restriction almost never affects gameplay. For one, she gets plus one plus one for each color among other legendary permanents you control, and Joda's first ability pumps her even further. Even if you only had Sisse and Joda on your battlefield, Joda is all five colors, which immediately makes Sisse a 7-7. And with Joda's ability, both creatures get an extra plus two plus two, which makes Sisse a 9-9. The highest mana cost for a legendary permanent in the deck is Avacyn at eight, so there won't be any trouble tutoring out whatever you want with Sisse's ability. Lastly, we have the extra triggers category. This category is comprised of Otha Teferi, Stryonic Resonator, Harmonic Prodigy, the Peregrine Dynamo, and Rings of Bright Hearth. Stryonic Resonator and Harmonic Prodigy synergize great with Joda, since you could end up cascading three times off of a single legendary spell. The Peregrine Dynamo can copy either triggered or activated abilities, but it has to be from a non-commander legendary source, which means it could get you an extra permanent from Sisse or even double loyalty abilities. Rings of Bright Hearth only triggers off of activated abilities, but just like the Peregrine Dynamo, it has a variety of uses that can get you closer to your win condition, especially with triggering Kaya multiple times. And now, the card that is actually centered around Planeswalkers, Oath of Teferi. Oath of Teferi outright allows you to trigger loyalty abilities twice a turn, rather than only once. I'd just like to add that there are infinite combos out there that use Oath of Teferi, but in this deck, it is strictly an enchantment that gets a little more value from our Planeswalkers. Even then, it is an extremely powerful card. Now that we've gone through most of the deck's important players, let's talk about some upgrades you might want to add to the deck to make it even better. Essica, God of the Tree, or the Prismatic Bridge is a great one, since it either makes your legendary creatures mana dorks like Relic of Legends, or gives you a free creature or planeswalker from your library on your upkeep. Captain Sisse tutors any legendary card to your hand, which can make it really easy to put together a strong board state early on, especially since you could potentially copy her trigger with cards like the Peregrine Dynamo and Rings of Bright Hearth that I mentioned earlier. If you want even more value, creatures like Chulane, Teller of Tales, and Kenrith the Returned King are never bad includes. I don't normally include lands in this segment, but I feel that a 5 color commander like this needs a strong mana base to function well. Any of the fetch lands or shock lands would immediately make this deck all the better, but many fixers like the World Tree, Dryad of the Elysian Grove, or Chromatic Lantern would be just as good. There are any number of other legendary creatures that you could add to this deck for even more value, but these are just my personal picks to add to an already amazing deck. With the logistics of the deck out of the way, I'd like to talk about my personal thoughts on the commander, Joda, and why I decided to build around him. Whenever I built a deck in the past, it was always because there was an archetype of play within Magic I wanted to explore, and I would find a commander that fit that playstyle. With Joda, however, it was very much an impulse build. I was looking at spoilers for Dominary United on Reddit, and that stained glass showcase art of his caught my eye. I started reading the card, saw that it was 5 color and had Cascade, and was immediately hooked. I had always entertained the idea of building around a card called the First Sliver, since Cascade was a very powerful and yet random ability that I'd wanted to push the limits of. However, if you know anything about Slivers, they are not very well liked in the commander community for the most part, so playing them at a table almost always puts a target on your back. 
I also liked how Jota not only gave you free legendary spells, but also rewarded you for those spells being creatures. Jota is like the first Sliver and Sliver Legion, all rolled into one card, which is an amazing set of abilities to have in the command zone. Plus, Dominary United was completely centered around legendary creatures, which helped Jota hit the ground running in terms of popularity. All in all, I'm just a sucker for big creatures and five color good stuff, and Jota fits that bill perfectly. With that being said, I hope all of you have enjoyed this review. If you did and you have any feedback about the deck or want me to review another commander, please let me know in the comments below. More reviews like this one will be coming in the near future, so look forward to them. Until then, I will see all of you in the next video.